Talking Memphis Wrestling with Randy Hill and special guests. Yesterday on the Power Pro Wrestling Watch Along opening segment, you know what, people? First of all, I will tell you, the 21st day of March 2023, I'm the owner, the founder, the president of a Power Pro Wrestling, and I'm energized, fired up, and ready to go talking Memphis wrestling tonight. It'll be fun. It's a big show. My buddy, my best buddy, Randy Dandy, Randall West is in the house. Hello, Randy Dandy. And one of the things I'll say in just a few minutes, he already knows because he knows because of the fact that we're friends. And I told him because I moaned the blues. I was crying to him a little bit. I'll tell that story in a minute. Jeff Rolf Wheeler is in the house as well. Now, I can already tell you that I've got the flow. I've got the energy. Hey, Brooks, what's going on compared to last night? I know I wasn't drunk. I know I wasn't high. I know I wasn't even in a bad mood and wasn't sick. I don't know what happened, but we were about 10 or 15 minutes into that show I figured out I freaking sucked. I absolutely sucked. I was horrible. I was boring. I was stuttering. I was stammering. I absolutely sucked. Now, I come to you only a day later. I fixed myself yesterday because I blew my producer Adam Dunn's mind because about 10 minutes in, whatever the case may be, I said, hey, we're starting over. Play the open again. Reset. So he did it because he's used to me adding things just out of the blue, randomly. I do that. Expect the unexpected. I love that stuff. So that's what we did. We started over. Then, I don't know how long we were into the thing. We lost, I don't know if it was a storm outside, I don't know what in the world happened, but we lost signal and couldn't get back, and we had to log off, come back on, we lost the audience, got the audience back, it was chaos for sure, absolutely for sure. Breaking news right now before we bring in the panel, I want to tell you on breaking news, it was announced by the W. W.E. yesterday, new member of the Celebrity Wing of the of the WWE Hall of Fame, Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman finally in the Hall of Fame. Very well deserved. Andy Kaufman, January the 17th, 1949, passed away at age 33, May 16th of 1984 he will be inducted in the wwe hall of fame coming up either on april the first or april the second at wrestlemania 39 and it's gonna be a big one in los angeles as wrestlemania goes hollywood yay big wrestlemania card and we may get to that a little later on as well Hey, I want to do a plug ski, a plug, the advertising. My buddy Greg Wayne will review and premiere his new podcast, his new video cast, Wayne's World, on Facebook with your host, Greg Wayne. So make sure you check out Greg tomorrow at 7 o'clock central pj is in the house Esky lee is in the house my buddy john mccall i'm gonna do his podcast he's in the house my buddy michael my real good close personal friend from georgia al tuttle in the house my producer adam dunn my favorite producer 
of all time because Adam knows it. He's my second producer, favorite producer of all time. Randy West is my first. Lucian from the Kentucky area in the house. He's currently in Sykeston, Missouri. That's not too long, too much far from Jonesboro, Arkansas. Another thing that I want to tell you, I want to talk about the greatest of all time who celebrated a birthday in heaven this past Saturday, the great Lance Russell. And we will show a few pictures. That's a great picture, one of my favorite shots. It was taken at Jerry Lawler's Hall of Fame bar and grill. Lance sitting on the stage, a great drawing of Kaufman and Waller from the David Letterman show. It looks like Lance is there live and it is great. Lance was born in 1926. He died in 2017. This past Saturday, as we continue to look at these great pictures, these great pictures are just fantastic and I love them to death. Lance would have been this past Saturday, 97 years old, the greatest of all time. And we have a tribute video we'll show in a few minutes that his oldest son, Rusty Lance Jr., we will we see the Russell family there along with me at the Celebration of Life at Jerry Lawler's Hall of Fame Bar and Grill, 159 Bill Street in Memphis, Tennessee. So there's some famous uh, yellow again, everybody. Son of a gun. Oh, come on, heart. We'll show you some class. What in the Sam Hill? Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Marlin, we need some help out here. Happy heavenly birthday to the great Lance Russell. And I love me some Lance Russell. We'll bring in right now, and I think he will agree that I'm not struggling with this open like I screwed the open up yesterday and hadn't start had to start all over again. Pat Trammell, welcome to this show, and you got a energized version of good old RH today. Welcome to the show. I think I think your spring haircut has re-energized you, Randy. Looking good, looking good. Hello to all our friends. Hello, Ahmad. And uh Looking good tonight. What's got going me energized. on? What is going on in Pat Trammell and all the Trammell's life? How are you guys doing, Pat? We're doing fine. I'm getting my car fixed, so I'm driving a rental car that may or may not be out of gas. Uh, uh, Suzanne is in Chattanooga seeing Meg, and White is back in Memphis. Oh, my goodness. He's in the danger zone. Danger zone. Danger zone for sure. Well, and happy, happy, happy birthday to Lance. When you talked about Andy and you talked about Lance, I'm sure they're in heaven. And Randy, I bet Lance in, congratulated Andy on being in the WWE Hall of Fame. And Absolutely. he said, that's nice, but my most important Hall of Fame is the Memphis Wrestling Hall of Fame. I appreciate that very much. Everybody in the house, again, I said Lucian, Jeff Rock Wheeler, has opinions as he always does and i appreciate those david linville and my buddy you, my, my buddy greg wayne is in the house be sure to check out his show coming up of course i said said al is in the house i love al and frank seaton in the house that well hey we have some congratulations to do because adam made me aware of this from the fun radio Facebook page yesterday. The winner of some awards were announced yesterday. Some great radio awards for the state of Alabama. I think an on-air personality, a sales personality. It's just fantastic. And let's go ahead and put up the graphic up there if we could. Adam, if we could put the graphic beside Michael right now and we will put both stations up there if we can go to the captions and get it up there and apparently we cannot oh here it is it's fun radio 92.7 it's 13 10 a.m and 104.9 fm just go ahead and google either fun radio tennessee or fun radio alabama and you'll have 
a lot of great radio, classic radio. I love it to death. Listen to it all the time. Fun Radio Group Incorporated is the official big shot name of the company. They do great local radio, just like I listen to East Arkansas Broadcasting, the group that Brandon Baxter is affiliated with. Certainly, I listen to Fun Radio. Now we'll bring Michael St. John, award winner once again, man. You're going to have to build a trophy man, a tra trophy room in that mansion on top of that hill. <laughs> Well, first of all, Randy, thank you. I'm honored to be with you, but you know, I got to give credit what credit is due. I've got a great staff. There's only five of us and, uh, I've got a great staff and they did it. They won it. And uh, I was just, you know, you have those proud moments in your life, Randy. I know you've had them, uh, during the, uh, induction ceremonies for the Memphis wrestling hall of fame, Pat, I know you've won awards before and you know what I'm talking about when somebody that works with you or somebody that you feel responsible about bringing them on in their career wins an award and is, uh, recognized by people outside of your world as for what they do in their world. That's one of the proudest moments. I think any individual man, woman, or child can have winning an award is nice. It is appreciated, but boy, when one of your proteges or somebody that you put some time and effort in just exceeds in any and all expectation and wins those awards as Adam Ward and Kevin uh, Wilbert did, uh, uh, that, that made me feel, I, I felt as good about them winning and watching them get those awards on uh, Saturday night in Birmingham at the club as I've ever been proud in all my life. And I want to also give credit to uh, some good friends of ours. We work closely with way TV channel 31, the ABC affiliate in Huntsville and, uh, the original owner of way TV, uh, MD Smith, the third gave me my break in broadcasting when I was checking him out at the cash register at Bruno's supermarket at the mall on Parkway and university. And I was 15 years old going on 16. And he asked me if I'd, uh, he'd heard me make an announcement in store and asked me if I wanted ever wanted to be on the radio. And that was the magic words. And Mr. Smith gave me the chance. And now what is the, uh, uh, his station has, uh, of course, of course he sold Well, actually his son sold it about 15 years ago. And they just won for the second year in a row television station of the year in Alabama. We're affiliated with them in that we take their news and their weather. And we work very closely with their sports department and they're wonderful folks. And Mike Wright out of, uh, uh used to be the stadium announcer for the Texas A&M Aggies football team is their general manager and a good friend. And their whole staff is, they've just done a great job. So a big salute to our friends at way TV. And by the way, Mike's a big wrestling fan as well. All right. That is a good thing. Hey, I appreciate everybody saying hello to us. David is saying that he won the citizenship award back in high school. So that is good. Proud of you, Liza. I appreciate you sharing everything. No, you can't stay long, mate, but we will see you there in the lounge down under in Australia. Pop back in after your appointment's over. And we appreciate everybody. Again, I pointed out. Randy West is with us today, and I appreciate that very much. Let me throw in how my day started today, and it wasn't good, folks. But as you can see, I'm motivated, and I'm energized, and I'm in a good, good mood. So as you get older, you have to go to the doctor more. Everybody knows that I recently had to go, and I still have to go. I have to go back in the month of April and I have to go do a stress test and the cardio type of thing. There's always a little thing going on. And I was diagnosed as a diabetic. And so they want to keep up with that. My physician wants to keep up with that. So they sent me to an eye doctor to do a diabetic eye exam. And that went good. And they looked at all that and there's no issues there, but there is issues and even though that it's not affecting my driving right now obviously that's how i paid the bills so it's a situation that's very concerned and the cataracts that i knew that i have that i've been putting off for quite some time i don't need to put it off anymore because they're getting in bad shape and at this point i have to think about the future and my driver's license expires and i don't want to get myself in a situation that i'm not in now but the driver's license expire on december the 9th 2020 
4th, December the 10th, 2024. So I don't want to get in a situation and ignore these cataracts. And then on December the 10th, 2024, over a year away, but still, you don't want to get in a situation where I can't pass that eye exam and I can't have driver's license. So I'm working on that. Man, there's a lot of people talking as well. Pat, you've already mentioned Lance Russell. I'm sure if you're at home, you'll try to watch Wayne's World with Greg Wayne on Facebook as he premieres his new show Wednesday night at 7 Central. Absolutely. Look forward to that. Absolutely. Adam, what I want to do right now, I want to put go run through those pictures, then we'll go to Michael, and then we'll go to a special video that we stole from Rusty Russell, Lance Russell Jr. did a great, great thing on Facebook about his dad. It's six minutes long, and we'll see that. But I want you to go through those, Adam, pictures of Lance Russell again. Great, great, legendary Memphis Wrestling Hall of Famer, not in the WWE Hall of Fame. One of my favorite pictures ever with Kaufman and Lawler at Jerry Lawler's Hall of Fame Bar and Grill that is up on the stage. It looks like Lance is really sitting right in front of them. It's one of the classic, classic, classic picture as we continue to go on. That's me and the Lancer. Yay, me and Lance Russell. As we continue on with more pictures, one of my favorite all time, Tojo, Big Phil Hickerson, and Lance Russell in a race. That is greatness in action. And we continue on with the slides that we do have and some of the famous chains of Lance Russell. If you can read that monitor, I want you to go over those Michael St. John sayings of Lance Russell by Michael St. John. Well, I can't do it in Lance's inevitable style. You know, I wish this was a T-shirt. I think this would be a great Lance Russell T-shirt with, uh, with a profile of his uh, caricature of his face on the front and uh, uh, this on the back. And then, uh, of course, the logo from uh, Talking Memphis Wrestling on there. I think that, that might be something we need to talk about. But, boy, hey, now, come on, Tojo. Don't be starting that stuff again. Will you show <laughs> some class? Ah, come on, Hart. Son of a gun. By golly, we got a good one here. Eddie, can we get some help out here? Wait a minute. I am getting sick and tired of you coming out here every week. Yellow again, everybody. All right. Get these guys out of here, will you? We're going to take a break. Davey. Whoa, boy. Look out. What in the Sam Hill? All right. Don't get into that stuff. You got something to say to me, you better say it to him. That's the best I can do. I'm sorry, guys. Hey, war right winning. Stuff, man. Great, great, great. And that's the last minute. That's why I like live broadcasting. Because I didn't start this show at 7 o'clock thinking, well, we'll do this and we'll do th that. And when I show those pictures and do the sayings, then I'll have Michael St. John read them. I wasn't thinking that. But when it came up, I thought it's absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. Just uh, we'll talk about Lance a little bit more. And this is a show just like last week that got a ton of positive feedback on as we talked about the history of the Tennessee Territory. This is going to be a talk related show and just one video. That's all we got. But I think we can make it interesting and really have conversation and some debate because Michael and I see different, which is fine. Everybody has opinions. We totally are opposite on one, and we'll talk about that later and talk some modern wrestling. And we will talk the major subject today. I always talk positive. I talk about the glory days of Memphis wrestling. We do this timeline, but we're up to the late 80s. And to be all honest, and that's what I want to do with this show, there was a decline not only in Memphis wrestling, but the entire territory and also in the entire group of territories that were left because they were going away. We will talk about the declines of the territory, but I want you to do 30 seconds on Lance Russell. We've talked about him so many times, 30 seconds. Then I want you to pitch to his son, Rusty, Lance Jr.'s interview of Lance Russell that he posted on Facebook, and Adam will show that. Here's Michael St. John. 
Oh, thank you, Randy. I mean, uh, we have talked about uh, Lance just about on every show, and I think it is totally well worthwhile that we do it again and again and again because there was never one like him. There will never be one like him. He was, uh, you know, I don't know a lot of people that even imitated Lance Russell because he was so good. Uh, even a bad imitation would, been, would have been so bad. So you can't do Lance Russell. Lance Russell was Lance Russell. And and the great thing about Lance and Dave, and when I look back at the uh, some of the early shows and, and some of the video that we've seen when they were in studio, when one of the, some of the hottest things occurred in Memphis wrestling, Lance Russell was always in control. Whether he was talking on the microphone or behind the scenes or just him and Dave working together flawlessly the way they did. You know, Lance was one of these guys that he was not a control freak, but I think his 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 training and his uh, as a program director in television, you've got to always be on top of everything and know how things are going to go. So they'll go like clockwork. And, the, and that's what the beauty was of Lance Russell. I was honored on many occasions to be with Lance when Dave would be out and he and I would be working. And from the first time I ever joined Lance and worked with him, he made it so comfortable for somebody. He made it so easy. He made it to be Lance and I, uh, and and we we used to talk about this and laugh about it. We would not be together for two years and then we'll do a show together. And it was like, we were never apart. And he was like that weekly with Dave and, and the other co-host as well. So yeah, he's, he's just an in, in, incredible. And I think for Memphis wrestling, and that's what we talk about every week, for Andy Kaufman to be inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, which is the biggest of all wrestling Hall of Fames, the most recognized, the worldwide leader, uh, for Andy Kaufman, to, that was an angle that occurred in Memphis. That was a Memphis wrestling thing. Yeah, it got exposed on the David Letterman show. It got a lot of national press, if you would. But it was a Memphis wrestling thing. And for that to be honored in the WWE, I think that is tantamountly important to verify. It's verification. Uh, it's, it's, It's showing that Memphis wrestling was the premier wrestling of its age and of its day in the territory days. So I think without a doubt that that has to be said, but Lance Russell is a giant in our world. Uh, We lost him way too early. And I know he was in his nineties, but we still lost him too early. If we'd have lost him at 120, we'd have lost him too early because he was that great of a person and that great of a man, not only a great wrestling commentator, but a very great man and a nice man and somebody that lived as a nice person all his life. I love Lance Russell, and I I will go to my grave saying that he is the greatest of all time. And with that in mind, Lance Russell Jr., Rusty, had the opportunity to get with his dad and put this together. Hello, everybody. This is William Lance Russell back on March the 18th, which is Lance's birthday. Lance would have been 97 years old today, and I am posting this at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. I don't know, there's just something about that 11 a.m. Saturday morning time slot that feels right for posting a video about Lance and Memphis wrestling. Sadly, I need to start first by noting the passing of Jerry Jarrett a few weeks ago. Anyone who knows Memphis wrestling knows that Jerry Jarrett was the driving force behind the success of the Memphis territory. To be sure, he was aided by some very talented people who brought a dynamic and an energy to the Memphis Territory that few other territories had, but it was Jerry Jarrett who provided the roadmap to the Memphis Territory's success. I can tell you from personal experience that Lance had tremendous respect for what Jerry accomplished in the Memphis Wrestling Territory. He talked about it frequently, about Jerry's work ethic and the meticulous detail that he put into setting up the angles and the matches that resulted. I think it's safe to say that Lance would agree that without Jerry Jarrett, Memphis Wrestling would not have been what it was. I'm sure there would have been a Memphis Wrestling, but not Jerry Jarrett's Memphis Wrestling. On behalf of Lance and my brother Shane, myself, and all of the Russell family, we offer our condolences to Jerry's family, and we join with them and with you in celebrating the life of the man who brought us Memphis Wrestling. Thank you, Jerry, for the good times and the great memories. 
You know, each time someone close to the Memphis wrestling family passes away, it's hard not to get a little nostalgic about the glory days of Memphis wrestling. And with Jerry's passing, it got me thinking about something Lance wrote quite a while ago. Mark James, who has written the best collection of wrestling books of anybody I know, Mark asked Lance to write a foreword to one of his books. So Lance starts by writing down impressions that come to his mind as he thinks about Monday Night Wrestling, and what comes out turns out to be kind of revealing, I think. Lance held a special place in his heart for Monday Night, so special that he didn't really want to spoil it by bringing his kids along with him on Monday nights. He didn't want to be Dad on Monday night, he wanted to be Lance Russell on Monday night. As Lance got older and more prone to nostalgia, he'd pull out this audio cassette he had it was a copy of Jimmy Hart's song, Monday Night Memories. Lance loved that song, and when he played it, you could see him just drift off into his memories. Memories that he wrote about in the foreword to a book that Mark James wrote. Here's what Lance had to say about his Monday Night Memories. Oh, and listen to it in Lance's voice, not mine. These are the words of Lance Russell. It was pretty much the same each week. Dim the house lights, the crowd hushes. All eyes turn to the brightly lit ring. Expectation is thick in the air. I'd press that microphone close to my lips. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another big night of Memphis wrestling. The crowd responds every Monday, just like clockwork. And I'd love to tell you, as those lights dimmed and the crowd hushed, I would love to tell you that as I picked up that microphone, my heart rate kicked up a notch because I knew that tonight, this Monday night, there was magic in the air. Tonight just might be so memorable that 40 years from now, kids will be able to tell you where they were sitting and what they had on their hot dog. That's what I'd like to tell you, but that would not be true. Not true because this Monday night, just like all the other Monday nights, was what I did for 30 years. And when you do anything for that long, you kind of get into a routine. It was predictable. And yet, who was it once said, you never know when you're making a memory? How true. All those Monday nights, 3,000, 6,000, 11,000 people a week, tag teams, grudge matches, battle royales, championship bouts, six-man, 12-man, 21-man, no disqualification, loser leaves town, Texas tornado, leather strap on a 10-foot pole, hair versus hair, barbed wire, death match, and oh yeah, 50-cent beer night. Every Monday, just like clockwork. But who knew nicknames would remain so ingrained in our thoughts? Bearcat, Plowboy, Handsome Jimmy, Corsica Joe, The Interns, The Fabulous Ones, The Spoilers, Professor, Doctor, Superstar, The King, and Sputnik. Who knew we were making Monday night memories? Jimmy Hart knew. Jimmy, my friend and arch nemesis, wrote about the Monday night wrestling experience and his picture-perfect lyrics ring in my head to this day. And now, to kick those memories into overdrive, Mark James comes along with this wonderful collection of programs from the Monday night events. But more than that, this book is a portal to our own unique memories. Memories we experienced all to ourselves while standing among thousands of people. This book is a reminder of where we were, what we did, and how we felt on Monday night in Memphis, Tennessee. And it stands as a testament to the fact that even the routine can turn out to be very special. And speaking of memories, I don't think I ever told anybody about this, but I used to work for Roy Welch, half of the Memphis wrestling promotion team of Goulas and Welch before Jerry Jarrett took the helm. I was in high school at the time, and Mr. Welch hired me and another fellow to set up and tear down the ring for the Saturday shows. We each got paid $5 in cash. Fun fact, I was actually in the studio the day that a couple of wooden supports that held up the ring's floor broke and the entire floor of the wrestling ring just caved in on live TV, leaving these two wrestlers suspended only by the sagging canvas that was tied to the sides of the ring. And Lance and Dave were over there at the desk just yammering away like this, <laughs> this was a planned bit. It was hilarious. I don't remember who the wrestlers were. I want to say one of them was one of the Bass Brothers, but maybe that's just a guess. Surely someone remembers that event, right? 
Well, that's one of my memories, and I've taken up enough of your time, so hopefully I can make another video on Lance's next birthday, maybe. There's some footage I have of Lance talking about Memphis wrestling that I don't think anyone has ever seen before. So happy birthday to Lance, who was so very grateful for your love and support. So long, everybody. Last week, after we watched something, that gave me chills. We'll go with you, Pat. Your thoughts on Rusty's great tribute and happy birthday message to his dad. That did, did that. That was emotional. That was really emotional. Um, my gosh, how good that was! I re really, really, you, you know, you, you. I don't know. You just don't really have a. T I don't have enough time in my life to sit down and really think about the people that have, you know, who I never laid eyes on in person, but who have affected me and have been, you know, given so so much so much of themselves to so many people and are such a part of so many's lives that's that was really special michael i echo what pat says it's very very difficult to follow something like that and i thought rusty did a fabulous job but listening to lance's words and what he wrote it really gives you a sense of how dedicated and how loyal he was to memphis wrestling and what it meant to him. And with that in mind, I, it, it, it just sort of takes your, takes your breath away. Absolutely. Happy birthday from Talking Memphis Wrestling to the great Lance Cross. I've made a change in what we're going to do on this show right now. Because, Michael, I had it planned in my mind that, that sometimes drama makes good production, good TV. That sort of thing so as you can read on the notes a debate between me and you i'm not in the mood to debate with you today or with anybody else so we'll save that for another time but i, I do I, you know i'm right no you're absolutely wrong as wrong <laughs> as you've ever been in your life spoken a person that has booked memphis territory that has plenty of connections right now in the wrestling business and know that things change in the world but we won't get into that right now but i do want to say because i think the responsible people we are the three of us adam dunn as the producer and me as what michael st john says the uh, supporting star of this show that's what michael calls me the supporting star he's the main star the co-star is Pat. I am the supporting cast member on my no own freaking show. You want to take a promo? You want to get me fired up? By gosh, you can get me fired you up. You were wrong. What? You were wrong about that match on AEW. You're no, wrong. I wasn't. It was a Jeff Jarrett match. A Jeff Jarrett finish. You're just like Cornette. You're eating Cornette shit again. It's absolutely. The ratings were good. The people went crazy, and I think it was the second best television match ever from AEW. I really do. I think it was great. Could care less if Cornette liked it because it's all about opinions. Michael didn't like it. Cornette didn't like it. I thought it was great. Absolutely great. But, Randy, let me tell you something. Any match that Jeff Jarrett is in on AEW is going to be a great match because Jeff Jarrett's a great match, no matter what it is. That's but a good he, point. But my point is, is that the competition, the people that he's get, they're they're still using these, uh, as Jimmy Cornette, as you referred to him, calls them the Cucamonga kids. Well, I know where Cucamonga is. And trust me, you don't want to be there. And no. I, I lived out there. Rancho Cucamonga at one time was a beautiful area. And now you don't want to be there. My point is, is that Jeff Jarrett, I think, is in the higher echelon of wrestling talent in the world today forget about his age forget about what he's done in the past but where he is today i think jeff jarrett is just now starting to hit his peak and i think we're going to see this peak continue for for several years now he is the best talent absolutely without a doubt not debatable he has the most sense and obviously 
Orange Cassidy, what Jeff was able to do there, the key things that Jeff realizes that Orange Cassidy's numbers, quarter hours are good. He realizes his merchandise numbers are good. So Jeff led that match. It was Jeff all the way. So it wasn't 100% silly, but the audience, the core audience that liked that sort of thing, and there's people out there that like that sort of thing. Jeff was, sport, was smart enough to one spot where Orange does those phony looking kicks. Well, Jeff turned it around on him, and he making fun of him to get heat, and Jeff did it to him. I thought it was a masterpiece. Again, it could have been better. And the way Jeff likes his finishes, and I think you had an issue with so many false finishes. Normally, I do too, but Jeff says, I need to do the favor for this guy. Now, I personally, to go in another direction with the only – true heel of that territory, I would have switched the title on him. But they wasn't going to do that. So you can't fight City Hall. So that wasn't going to happen. So Jeff felt, I'm going to make this as exciting, as good, as unpredictable as I can make it. He's from Tennessee. So even though people, all the run-ins, all the gimmicks, all this, it's Memphis Wrestling 101. I thought the finish was brilliant and i love it i have a problem with the finish in that match i have a problem with finishes in wrestling per se almost across the board except in the nwa which none of you guys like but that's because nobody sees it but the, they they stick to more of to me when somebody puts a finishing move on another wrestler i don't care if it's jeff jared or orange grape or fruit peaches cassidy whatever his name is i don't care who it is when you put a finishing move on a wrestler they're done that's why it's called a finishing move. They're done to kick out of it or two or make it look and then come back and half-ass sell it and then go back and do another one and then come back and do another one. They're destroying what the business is all about. Not that it may not already be destroyed. My point in texting that and saying what I did and, pour, and, and pushing it a button on, on Tony Khan is, number one, I didn't like Tony Khan until I met him. I like him now. I want to be. I want to be a person that likes and supports what he does. But if he's listening to all these little goobers in his ears, all these little independent guys and all these guys that failed in the big, big time, that are now trying to make a comeback in AEW. If he would just stick to what he learned and he was so complimentary of Dave Brown, when I met him and talking with Dave and uh, so complimentary of Memphis wrestling and what he thought about Memphis wrestling, golly, Pete, uh, <laughs> Tony Khan, do Memphis wrestling, but do it in the 21st century style. And then you've got lightning in a bottle. But this stuff where, you know, somebody gives them a tombstone pile driver and the guy kicks out at two, that's bullshit. And the WWE does it. Everybody do it. I don't know why we just pick on AEW. But You're right. The, they got it from, here's the thing. And I hate, because I like the guy, and I hate to knock him, and I'm fixing to knock him. Damn, I wish I had some popcorn. The business, the business was changed forever because of one person. That one person wasn't Tony Khan. That one person was not even Vince McMahon. That person, and neither one of those, the person that changed the face of wrestling because he was smart enough to expose the freaking business. He was smart enough. It's a wonder somebody didn't kill the son of a gun back in those days. It really is. I'm surprised back in the 80s when Dave Meltzer put out the Wrestling Observer and exposed the business to a mainstream audience, somebody didn't kill him. I am surprised that didn't happen. But now there's a whole generation of wrestlers. Dave loves New Japan, and I don't hate New Japan. New Japan, but that's where the style of the not selling finishes and all that stuff, they didn't start in WWE. It certainly didn't start in AEW. It started in New Japan wrestling. The high spot type of wrestling didn't start in AEW or anywhere else, but Triple A, Lucha Libre. This, has been, this crowd's been around forever, 
but now here's the thing i'll it's now a lot of this stuff vince mcmahon or wwe does a lot of crap like may young giving birth to a hand and i mean horrible 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 stuff and i can go one thing after another bad 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 but let me tell you something it's he don't do a lot of the crap you see uh today that they do even though he's kind of to be as successful as Vince man he's changed with the times they've gone too far sometimes both companies go too far there's absolutely no doubt about it but the person i blame is dave Meltzer, and because tony khan grew up listening and reading Meltzer, and that's the kind of wrestling he likes a lot of talent in both companies including nwa grew up reading the wrestling observer even though in the last several years people with podcasts like eric bischoff and jim Cornette's turned on him and there Cornette was initial one of the original initial sources to to dave Meltzer. there's just no way he around exposed that dave Meltzer. you're right you're right Dave exposed the business. Cornette exposed Meltzer. You're right. Yeah, and but now Cornette, because of the fact he, Dave Meltzer doesn't like the fact that he, uh, Dave Meltzer doesn't like the fact that Cornette knocks Kenny Omega, who he thinks is the greatest wrestler in the world, and the Young Bucks. Well, to tell you the truth, I don't like them either. I don't like that style either. Now you give me Orange Cassidy and Darby Allen over the young bucks and kenny omega any day of the week and i'll take it i absolutely they are not my type of wrestling at all but i blame dave milk well a couple of things number one is there's something there's some things that i really like about aew and one of the things and you, you're gonna uh, wonder where this is coming from randy i like the lighting that aew is using on their tv and studio wrestling it's better than the WWE lighting. There's something more refreshing about it. And I like that. I like that a lot. The WWE, and you're talking about crazy, you know, stupid things. Well, it was one last night getting ready for, you know, WrestleMania Hollywood or whatever. They had a camera with Johnny Wrestling, Johnny Gargano. I don't get Johnny Gargano. I'm sorry. I, I just don't get him. But I don't get Ricochet either. And they've got him dressed up now and with a beard and everything looking like uh uh, looking like his, his tag team partner, which they look like Mutt and Jeff out of the comic strips. But uh, they had that thing where, where Johnny Gargano gets attacked in his driveway of his house and all that stuff. Come on, folks. Nobody is, you know, now if they'd have had video from his ring camera on his door of that, okay, that's a little bit more believing. But, you know, 44K uh, high definition TV audio with a cameraman and a producer there doesn't work. And by the way, I, I do have Japan and the United States on. I'm a big baseball fan and I've watched, I love this world baseball series. I don't like the players getting hurt, but it's a great game going on. But yes, Let, I had let's update. Let, let's, let's take a time out, time out real quick. Update the people on what you're talking about. The U S Japan game that's going on and, and update us on the score. Well, about 12 or 16 years ago, the Major League Baseball decided they wanted to go worldwide with something. Then they put together a thing where different countries play each other in a in a tournament, basically. And they put it, it, it was in the fall, I think, the first time, and then they moved it to the spring. So it, it takes away spring training from some of the superstars. But the players that are in the NBA and the Major League Baseball are playing professional baseball in other countries like Mexico or Japan or Puerto Rico or whatever, get to play in this World Baseball Classic. But a lot of the players that are on U.S. teams get to play for their home country. Shoshani Otani is playing tonight, who I think is the best player in Major League Baseball with the California Angels, or excuse me, the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. And he's playing tonight, and uh, and he's playing for Japan. And last night he went up against the guy that was pitching for the U.S., that, uh, or excuse me, for Mexico, that was his teammate, which was really interesting. Well, but I love, I love the showcase of all the stars. A couple of stars, uh, Edwin Diaz, the relief pitcher for the Mets, got hurt. Uh, Altuve got hurt, and it's going to cost him part of the season. I don't like that part, but you want to watch really great baseball. This is like watching the eight. This is like watching the All Star Game on steroids. 
it's really great baseball. And the U.S. is leading. Or I, well, I may take that back. I, I didn't see the last. I think Japan's leading two to one in the third right now, if I'm not mistaken. But they're in commercial. All right. That's very interesting. I want to go to Pat right now. Pat, it's unbelievable because usually when we talk about the state of Alabama, we talk about Nick Saban, we talk about Alabama football, and we should talk about Alabama football because they won championship after championship after championship. But there's a little basketball team going on. Do you think, Pat Trammell, that Alabama – is going to be our national champion of this year in basketball. What's your prediction? And then we'll go to Michael because he's an Alabama in too. Well, I, I mean, I would I obviously hope so. That's just such a long road to get to. But they got it got a lot easier because they, you know, Virginia lost and uh, and uh, somebody else lost in the uh, regional. So they're they're you know well on the way to the to the final four it looks like so we'll see what happens i want to say two things but and uh, th this is this is classic michael randy tete a tete and i don't want to be in the middle of it i think jeff jarrett a after he got you know he 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 took the time to take care of himself i think he is technically and otherwise wrestling the best matches of his entire career and jeff is what five three four years younger than how old is jeff I 54 54 something like that yeah. 54 so he's five years younger than me and he is wrestling absolutely in my opinion the best the best of his entire career okay michael well, we want to go number ahead, two Ryan. and this is more important okay. this is more important in the aw False finish, kickouts, all that, okay? Let me tell you guys something. You never saw Jerry Lawler pull the strap twice. Exactly. I did. Absolutely many times. Many times. He would make the comeback, and then he would be stopped. And he would be selling, and the strap would go up, and then he would sell some more. I've, I've seen that many, many, many times. You, You've got to find me a clip of that. I've never seen that. Okay, I wanted to get off of this, and I'm going to get off of this. And this last three minutes, I wish we could erase. Don't I get anyway. to talk about basketball? Yes, you will. But first of all, we got to go back to football. We got to to go back to baseball right now before you talk about basketball. Hey, Michael Nicholas, I think says Nicholas says, "Say, hey, Michael, do you agree that when healthy, no one is better than Mike Trout?" Uh, I think Shoshani Otani is the best player in baseball. He pitches, he plays the outfield, he plays 162 games. I, I Mike Trout is great, don't get me wrong, and I, I'm a Mike Trout fan. But my favorite part, my fa my, the, my number one baseball player is Shoshani Otani. I really believe that. My favorite National League player, you guys will like this, is Manny Machado for San Diego. I think Manny Machado. You know what? I, I played baseball when I was in, in, in high school and went out and tried out for Vanderbilt, got cut the first day by Larry Schmidt. And uh, probably the best thing ever happened to me. But baseball, then you could take a little guy that was 133 pounds and six foot tall that crouched and got a lot of walks and was speedy on the base pass, and you could have a, a real fun game. These players now, they are humongous. I mean, six foot, a pitcher six foot eight, my gosh, I'm, that guy's arm could reach home plate. I mean, it's amazing the quality of athletes they have in Major League Baseball. I Basketball. Think Johnny I think Ashani is the best player that's been in Major League Baseball in 35 years. I agree with that. I agree with that. Talk some Alabama basketball, Michael St. John. I'm about to get into trouble, Randy. Uh, I think there's a big black cloud over this Alabama basketball team. I think it was mishandled from when it happened. I think steps that were, were not taken are going to come back to haunt this, this situation. Um, I think there was a cover up. Hey, let, let's, I, let's, let's, let's hold you know up. what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. But I'm afraid our audience, it's a very interesting story that I've been keeping 
up with and we're just telling them half the story so get a little more detail man this is a wrestling angle folks this is a wrestling angle so michael really just explain is. it more is all i'm asking you to do if you will saturday night after a home game in january alabama basketball player darius miles and another gentleman in a shot and a, and a car were involved in a drive-by shooting and uh, a young lady lost her life in that shooting darius miles was arrested uh, and put into jail he has been charged with the capital murder and uh, it has come out since then that another star player on Alabama's team, Brandon Miller, who's from Nashville, Tennessee, is uh, probably their leading star, provided the gun. And so, and there are a lot of other tentacles that involve other players in the game, and there's a lot of rumor and innuendo, but boy, that thing was shut down in Tuscaloosa faster than you can say Nate Oates. And, uh, I, you know, Alabama's having their best year of basketball that I can remember. I... I sort of equate it when James Franklin was at Vanderbilt and brought in as the head football coach and three and three of his players two years later were arrested for raping a girl in one of the dormitories on campus. James Franklin powder took a powder and went to, uh, to Penn state. And that all got to be a mess and a half. That's what's going to happen at Alabama. I, you know, the, the deal at Alabama is who knew what and who was involved with what. And that has been just covered over. The press can't get involved in it. They're, They've been, I, I, I don't know, but I take it that they may have been uh, uh, gotten to the word may have gotten to them if they got into this, that they were not going to be able to have privileges that they now have. I don't know. Um, I know this, that Coach Saban yesterday in a press conference, they suspended a young man from the football team for an entirely different reason. But he made an interesting comment in that press conference that Nate Oates said that his player was at the wrong place at the wrong, wrong in the wrong place at the wrong time. Coach Saban said, quote, there is no such thing as being in the wrong place at the wrong time. You take responsibilities for your actions. So it's it's interesting what's going to develop. As for their football team, or excuse me, their basketball team, they're good. I think they'll make the uh, final, I think they'll they'll make the final four, but I don't think they'll win the tournament. Michael, uh, have you read the article that Ryan Phillips at the Patch in Tuscaloosa wrote? No, sir, I haven't. I've heard about it. I have not read it. Yeah, go go read that. And I'm not saying anything. I'm not disputing anything you've said. But it, he he's he's viewed all the video, and and gone through it. It's it, it's enlightening to read. We're a long way from figuring out any you know everything that actually happened there. But it it's an interesting. He's got an interesting reporting on it. And uh, anyway, it's a it's a tough situation. Well, Vanderbilt was winning with, with Franklin, but he was recruiting thugs. Excuse my French. He was recruiting thugs. Alabama's basketball team. What can I say? Absolutely, man. I like this. Talking about a lot of things here on Talking Memphis Wrestling. And we're talking about basketball we're talking about a murder we're talking about all kinds of stuff i'm talking memphis wrestling i want to talk before we get in the decline of memphis wrestling we'll do that in just a few minutes but when we come back from this little break i want to talk and preview a little bit and get everybody else what their feeling is on wrestlemania 39 and we'll be back right after this Living the Dream, Memphis Wrestling, The Randy Hale Story, is available now at randyhalesmemphiswrestling.com. One of the things I want to talk to both of you guys about, and we'll get to wrestling in a moment, one of my favorite time of the year is the big dance. My favorite time is March Madness. I love that tournament and all the upsets of this past weekend. Man, I was glued to my TV, and it was absolutely great. Duke is out. So many people out. And Lucian in Lexington, Kentucky, is upset that his Wildcats fell to Kansas City. Uh, Kansas City State, I believe, is the name of the, the team. The Arkansas Razorbacks 
beat Kansas, last year's champions. So the Razorbacks, who had a horrible end of the season, that I wouldn't, th- I didn't think they were deserving to be in the tournament. Didn't think they were going to be in the tournament. The Hogs, the Razorbacks, Blue Pig Suey, all that crap. Anyway, it's an exciting time. Pat, we'll go with you first. This year's tournament. Outside of all these great upsets with Duke losing and and so many people didn't who else has lost Provincetown who big teams have lost yeah well like both two of the two of the four uh, Purdue lost of course yes uh, by by Farley Dickinson which I if you tell me where that is I'll know uh, I think where is it Michael. Teaneck, New Jersey, and until about six years ago, it was an all-girls school at one time. Okay, okay. Well, I had heard the name maybe once before, but, you know, I, I guess I've seen four or five, uh, four or five um, uh, last-second last second shots win the game. I will tell you, my, my dark horse, dark horse, dark horse sleeper is the Princeton Tigers. That will be interesting. What do you guys think? Because it affects Jonesboro, I think, in Arkansas State University. My friend, who I actually was in a wrestling match with at the Earl Bell Community Center, Coach Mike Bolato, been here for six years. He lost his stud to Miami and his other stud to somewhere else. And both of those players were great and helped their team get to the tournament and get some victories in the tournament the tournament so that is great one of the guys went to miami one of them i think went to kansas state doing a great job but mike bolado was a disciple of rick patino rick patino of course was in louisville and then had a disgrace like a lot of people do and he went away and he came back he's 70 years old and he took iona to the nc2a tournament and after they lost their second or second round round game they had a big win then they lost the game and he was was hired he was hired to be help me here the coach of St. John's I think I'm correct yeah and I had nothing to do with the hiring they didn't consult me on it so just so people know Did, okay at, at all but so here's what I think is going to happen Mike Bolado was fired. So he's gone. He's the disciple of Rick Patino. Okay. Now, Mike Anderson is a former coach of the Arkansas Razorbacks, and he was fired at Georgetown. Am I correct so far? No, he was, he was fired, fired at St. John. St. John, yeah. For, and a former, former UAB coach. Yeah, yeah, coach of Missouri, too. Yeah. Apparently, he is suing St. John's because he said that they made stuff up and it was a wrongful thing. He was in Jonesboro, uh, from what I hear from not great sources, but what's being reported online, you can't believe what you read online. But at the same time, he was apparently in Jonesboro this past Friday. Interviewing I'm going to I'm gonna tell, you, I'm gonna tell you something about my – about uh, Mike Anderson. Mike Anderson is from Birmingham. He played at, at Jefferson State Community College, where my uh, where my college roommate and best friend from high school and legendary high school basketball coach in his own right went. They played together, and then Mike went to UAB. Um, and I've I've known Mike since 1983. Uh, off and on, we're not close friends or anything, but but I knew him when he was at UAB, and I knew him at, at Jeff State. Mike Anderson is one of the highest character people I probably have ever known in my life, and it's interesting that St. John's says they have fired him for a cause, and that's what he's suing them about. And yes. that if that's that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I think they wanted to move him aside so they could bring Patino in, who is who who is a legitimate scumbag, but a good basketball coach. If they he, fired him for cause because he wouldn't bring in any of the thugs to win the basketball games. Yeah, if you if you get Mike Anderson, uh, the the Red Wolves have done a fine day's work. 
Agreed. I just don't know. I just don't know. And I like Mike Anderson with the Razorbacks. So, so I, I don't have a dog in the hunt and there's nobody out there. I just a personal friend of Mike Bellotto. So I hated that he's gone, but he didn't win. Bottom line, that's the job. That is the job without a doubt in the world. Okay, right now we're going to switch to wrestling. And before we get to our subject of the day, which is the decline of Memphis wrestling. I want to talk about WrestleMania. And it'll be April the 1st or the 2nd as I read the card or the projected card. Adam will put up there that information with that billboard. WrestleMania goes Hollywood. And interesting, interesting card. And one of the matches, and I know one of these guys and we'll let Michael We'll let Michael comment on in a few minutes after I read the entire two nights listed of matches. It's not split up on what night gets what. Certainly, one of the matches that's suspected to be signed is father against father, Dominic Mysterio against Ray Mysterio. That match is scheduled. And just personally, that story has usually, I don't like father against son. I think they've done a very good job with it just this past week or on smackdown one or the other they confirmed what we knew that would happen kevin owens and sammy Zayn against the usos and that's exciting and i think that will be very very interesting and i think that might very well be a main event of the first night and the main event of the second night will be cody and roman reigns then another match that I don't care too much for, Brock Lester against Omos. Some people like the big monsters, the big giants. And I like Brock Lesnar, Omos. I just don't know about it. I think a little bit too green. Then a six-person ladies tag match, Becky Lynch, Trish and Lita. They go back with Trish and Lita like that with Becky Lynch who is over like Rover, the man they call her, against damage control. So that should be interesting. A celebrity, imagine that at WrestleMania, Logan Paul, that I think has done a great job, especially with his match with Roman Reigns, against Seth Rollins. Then a Hell in a Cell match, Edge against Finn Balor. Then you have a triple threat. Some like Dave Meltzer, are predicting will be the match of the night. The match of the night's the match that drew the money, dick face. Dave Meltzer, I can tell you, the match that drew the money. Anyway, I'm looking forward to Gunther versus Drew McIntyre versus Sheamus. Then a U.S. title match and another match that will help sell tickets, and that's John Cena against Austin Theory. Then the Raw ladies title, Asuka against Bianca Belair, a SmackDown match, Charlotte Flair against Rhea Ripley. And there is a rumor that on night one, that if it's not the Usos in their match against Owens and Zayn against Charlotte Flair and Rhea Ripley for the SmackDown championship that'll be night one main event and i understand they've had had the ladies hot and ready to go before and and they've had main events on one of the nights of wrestlemania and they should have been this year i just don't think is the year because i think the two hottest things going and they should headline wrestlemania one of them's the Usos, Sammy and Kevin Owens. The other one is Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes. I've liked everything Roman and Cody has done, except the very last part of the closing deal of Raw last night. That didn't do much for me. I think they hurt themselves a little bit, but still... A very good WrestleMania card, April 1st and 2nd. Pat, we'll go with you first. I I, 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 I agree mostly with with everything you said there, Randy. I am 
I am going to buy that because I do want to see Roman Reigns and Cody. I think I, I think Roman Reigns would have been a superstar in any era. I don't know that necessarily about Cody, but uh, I'll tell you, I think that's going to be a great match. Michael? Uh, you know, I, it's a lot to keep up with, Randy. Uh, yeah. You're talking about two days, and you're talking about angles upon angles and programs upon programs. Um, I I think they're going to put the belt on Cody Reigns, or on Cody Rhodes, mm -hmm. rather, uh, off of Roman, because – to me, it seems, you know, we haven't seen Roman wrestle a lot. And, you know, he came back from his scare from, from, uh, leukemia. And honestly, I think he either maybe have a, has a movie deal or perhaps needs some time off. So, um, I I'm expecting that title to go on, on Cody. Uh, I love the tag team, uh, the Usos against, uh, uh, the two Canadian boys with, uh, uh, Sammy Zayn and, 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 uh, you know, I, I, I think it's a little late in the game for them to get to that point. They've been working to that point now for eight weeks, nine weeks on TV. Um, I think they could have gotten to it a little quicker to give it a little bit more of a blow up between the two before they actually go uh, head to head at WrestleMania. I like, yeah, I, I, now on the women's side, I honestly, Randy, think Rhea Ripley is one of the toughest looking wrestlers. I agree. In the women's division that has ever been there. And of yeah, course, I think Charlotte, they're both great. I think they're both great. And Charlotte is awesome. Um, Becky Lynch, in my opinion, and I'm not being sexist here, ladies, because I, I, I adore motherhood and God bless you all. all everyone that has ever bore a, a child has gone through a lot more pain and suffering than I ever would in my life. But I'll say this much. I don't think Becky Lynch has been the same Becky Lynch since she had her child that she was before that. Now, I don't know if that's by, uh, because that she has duties as a mom now, or if it's just a situation where her body has changed from giving birth to a child. I, I just don't get the same feeling or the, the same feeling with Becky Lynch, because I really think Be Becky Lynch sort of took over that division at one point. Bianca Belair's to me is the question mark. I know she's a former Tennessee player. Uh, she's a very, uh, she's very athletic, no doubt about it, but I don't see her being the face of the women's division in the WWE long-term. And, and then some of the other matches, I, I the Brock Lesnar thing surprises me. I think that's a throwaway match. I, I think they couldn't come up with something better. Uh, what I have under understand and just reading online so it may not be true they pitched him brock against bray wyatt right. and brock they, said i didn't know brock said no and they also pitched brock against steve austin and steve oh. austin said no i like don't like the brave option the austin option you know i don't know if i would i would do that do you think for two nights, obviously the tickets are sold. I mean, they've already sold, but that's the first step, selling the tickets. But then again, you want a hell of a night where people think they spent this big money and th that was the money was worth it. Do you think they can get two great, interesting, fun nights out of this? I, I don't think they're going to be equal, personally. Um, the question is, I, I thought that was a two day ticket. I thought they had a ticket where you could go both nights. Is that not the case? There, they, they do have that option that okay. you can buy a ticket for both nights. Well, I, I just see, you know, the, to me, the reins and, and Cody Rhodes thing has well been well put together. I like how they've got to this point, Randy, because it's, they, they, they went at it a different way. They made it a personal issue. And as you know, personal issues, sell tickets and sell money and make money. They made it a personal issue from show one, from day one between Roman and, 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 uh, and Cody Rhodes in that Roman claiming he was trained and taught and, and really was the protege of, of Dusty. Whereas Cody, of course, was the son of Dusty. And then the fact of the matter, and I think the most, uh, I think the hottest piece of heat I've he heard on the WWE in years was when Roman Reigns said to Cody Rhodes, I was your daddy, your dad's son that he always wanted, that I, I was the one. That he was always great. Wanted. I great. thought, boy, you talk about a heat seeking missile. My 
goodness. But I, you know, my question is, and I've seen Cody in action a couple of times. He's he's good. I don't think he's Jeff Jarrett good personally. I don't I think, think anybody's Jeff Jarrett good. Okay, I, uh, I think that's, he's that's that good. Opinion. I think he's so far above anybody else. So I will agree with that comment. Absolutely agree with that comment. Do I think he's fresher at the top? than Jeff probably now, and do I think the story is probably better than than a story they could tell? I probably do, so I think it's of the right main event, but comparing talent to talent, no. I'll pick Jeff any day of the week. And, Adam, I want you to put up Nick's, and this is out of my wheelhouse, but pick up Nick's last comment, and he says, Randy, if you have time, and I'll make time, can the panel tell us, who they think is the most slept on wrestler. And I think he means over, uh, I, I really don't know what, what he means. Overlooked he means wrestler, underrated. Underrated oh, okay. wrestler uh, in the WWE. His pick is the, the LA Knight. You know, I, I can't answer that question because I don't watch a lot of that product. Uh, Pat, I don't think you do. Michael probably watches more than any of us, but I'm not sure of that either. Can you answer that question? Pat. You know, I I mean different people like different folks. I mean, I, I think Gunther's great. But you know, no nobody's you know, that he's not getting a shot at a belt. I think I, he will. I think he'll be the guy he's got the look I think and he he'll can main work. event the 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 yeah, absolutely, two thousand twenty four. But I think they're just not rushing him. I don't think he's underrated or underlooked or sleeping on him i think it's just it takes a process it really does you know, so it, I, it, I think it, it it's hard if you're wwe um because they you know that if you are if you can draw some money you're going to be on that payroll i mean and particularly now that uh particularly now that they've got some competition and it's, you know, if you look at the heyday of Memphis wrestling in the good runs, you know, there were probably, you know, it was it was Lawler's quest for the gold. It was Lawler and Dundee. It was, you know, five or six guys. But, I mean, they've got, you know, on that payroll, they've got, hell, Hundreds. 10 main event headliner guys, right? A hundred talents, yeah. you know, yeah. absolutely. There's no doubt about it. I can't tell you. I, and I didn't blame L.A. Knight for this, but it seems like on the last pay-per-view, one of the last pay-per-views I saw, I saw L.A. Knight against Bray Wyatt. Wyatt. Did that happen on a recent pay-per-view, Michael? I don't I don't buy their pay-per-views, so I'm, I'm not sure on that at all. Well, uh, anyway, I you... anyway, I can't tell you nothing. I, everybody, Al and several people really are high on L.A. Knight. I couldn't. I could not pick L.A. Knight out of a police lineup. Could y'all? No. Could you pass? Think, yeah, I've, I've seen him a couple times. I think the most underused and poorly programmed talent that they've had in years is A.J. Styles. Absolutely. I think, I think A.J. Styles is a superstar. I, you know, and uh, I'm biased because I got to work with him when he was young at Russell Birmingham and, and then the, he, he, he didn't want to go to the WWE fearing that they were not going to use him the way that he thought he needed to be used. And by golly, when he finally signed, they ended up doing exactly what he feared they were going to do. At and they time, lost him in the shuffle. At times they did, absolutely. But they've lost a lot of people in the shuffle. He's also several time holder of that WWE talent. And he's been on, on top. Plus, it's all about the money. It's absolutely about the money. And to support his family and set them up for the rest of their life. It was the right decision for for him. And apparently, I heard Jeff Jarrett talking on a podcast months ago that that AJ does not regret the decision to go. And certainly, I don't know if that's the public face of, of the situation or, or not. You know, I, I am not sure. And uh, Nicholas says, I'm happy that AJ – got that spot against Taker at WrestleMania, even though that that's another thing. Do you think in when he 
left TNA, AJ Styles, and went to the WWE, do you think he thought that he would have been handpicked by the Undertaker to be in a WrestleMania match that up to this point and probably for life will be Undertaker's last match? Do you think AJ would have ever pro projected or predicted or dreamed he would have got that opportunity? I don't think it was foreshadowed, but I think it was a great matchup because oh, you're yeah. talking about two Southern boys that were Southern bred and trained right here in the South. That's that exactly right. That's what I was thinking. Yes. AJ apparently Al says is hurt right now, but I'm excited about it. And here's the thing. Either I'll, I'll tell this to you off the air because right. what I'm about to say, I'm about to say something that's illegal, so I'll say it off the air, okay? I, well, I will tell you, can I, can, I make a, can I make a prediction? Yes. The Seth Rollins-Logan Paul match will be a very good wrestling match. I agree. Absolutely. I think of all the, star, all the media stars that have been brought into the WWE, I think Logan Paul, A, takes it the most seriously, and B, can work. So and that, he's an athlete. He's an oh, yeah, athlete. Exactly. Exactly. You can when believe the asked, stuff. When they were asking the question about which a WWE girl or a person had been slept on, I thought of the girls' division, but that, that's just me. Oh, Michael, you hadn't changed a lick. Look at Pat shaking his head. Oh, my goodness. We're going to switch gears right now. Back me up as I go real quick, briefly, full screen right now, Adam, as I'm going to read from my notes and I didn't incorporate this. So any generic type of stuff that you can just throw up there as I talk, because we've really enjoyed the timeline of Memphis wrestling. We started in the early seventies and here we go. We looked at 1989 last week. And one of the things we saw last week was Jerry Lawler finally after his very first world title challenge against Jack Briscoe in 1973, he finally won the AWA title against the future Mr. Perfect in May of 1988. Business fell off. You gave the people what they wanted, and they certainly didn't want to pay to see Lawler lose that championship. That's why Jerry Jarrett traditionally kept the Southern Heavyweight Championship, especially in the early days, and the Southern Tag Team Championship on the hills. Also, in June, we had a big sponsorship with the Red Man Chewing Tobacco Company and their subsidiary of Renegade, and they had a tournament all over the territory. Scott Steiner won the Renegade Rampage Tournament. And we made some money off of that and got into a relationship with Chris Von Eric, Terry, Kevin, the Von Erics, and the relationship with World Class Wrestling started. June the 27th, Terry, Von Eric, Jerry Lawler, first time in Memphis for the very, very first time, Terry and Lawler, they would have many more matches. Then... They came up with a combination show for a pay-per-view for Vern Gagne. It was Vern Gagne with the AWA in Minneapolis, the World Class out of Texas, and the CWA, the Jarrett Promotions Group. They did three TV, more shoots. There was more TVs than that, but it happened on September the 17th at the Nashville Municipal Auditorium, Mike Shields, the original video producer for Jerry Jarrett, Randy West, when Mike went away and got out of the wrestling business, Randy West came in. Mike did a great job, and Randy West did greater. There's no doubt about it. Mike ended up deciding not to do what he quit to do and decided he wanted to come back, and Jerry Jarrett said, no. I've hired somebody and doing a great job. I'm not getting rid of him. And so he got Mike a job with the AWA. So Mike flew down, met with me and Randy. We met at the National Municipal Auditorium. 
And Mike just thought he's kind of too big. And another thing, Mike Shields, and the Michael, we'll get back with you in a, a minute on this subject. When I was probably 20 years old, I sent a videotape because I was trying to get in with some somewhere to do wrestling commentary and do that sort of thing. I sent a videotape, Randy edited together. Mike Shields called me, not Vern, not Greg, not Wahoo. Mike freaking Shields, who I ended up liking him eventually, but he called me and said, we can't use you, Randy. Said, when you can figure out how to be yourself, give us a call again. Said, all you are is a Lance Russell copy and a Lance Russell wannabe. Anyway, that's my relationship with Mike, who, again, i he's passed away now, rest in peace. I ended up getting along, but I thought he was, uh, at some points, certainly, in my situation changed. Some, I thought he was a red-headed prick is what I thought he was. Anyway, they had these three nights of TV tapings. Nashville on the September 17th at the Municipal Auditorium. On the 18th, Louisville, Kentucky at the Louisville Gardens. Greg Gagne rode with me. They had a big dinner at Jerry Jarrett's house and then Eddie Marlin and then Jerry Jarrett with the limousine. Several cars went. I took Greg and a few other people, but we left so late. The lunch went late. I drove 130 miles an hour the whole way there, scared Greg to death, but we had to, to be there. So then the the very next night, September 19th, was Memphis at the Mid-South Coliseum. They taped months worth of television. And real quick, to give you a general idea, world-class CWA and AWA together, CWA, AWA, and world-class, this was the TV type of taping, and I'll do it quick because there's a lot of matches, 18 matches. Rock and roll, RPMs. The Rock and Roll Express, Rock and Roll Express and Sergeant Slaughter against Houstonoff, Khan, and Colonel De Beers. Medusa against Mimi. Tommy Rich against Jimmy Vaya. Chief Wahoo McDaniel against The Beast. Ron Garvin against Robert Gibson. The Samoan SWAT team against Billy Travis and Sean Baxter. Greg Gagne against Terry Adonis. Robert Fuller, Jimmy Golden against Nature's Best. Pat Tanaka. Paul Diamond against the Rock and Roll RPMs. Mando, Hector, and Chavo Guerrero against Gary Young, Cactus Jack, and Mike Enos. Then it was Manny Fernandez against Ray Odyssey, Sergeant Slaughter against Terry O'Donis, Iceman King Parson against Keith Eric, Ricky Rice and John Paul against the Hangman and the Beast, Brickhouse Brown, Bill Dundee, and Jeff Jarrett against Robert Roller, Jimmy Golden, Phil Hickerson, the Samoan SWAT teams versus Michael Hayes, Steve Cox. Then it was Wendy Ricker, Richler against Medusa and Jerry Lawler, double disqualification with Kerry Von Eri. It did not draw great. It was 18 matches. And it, besides the, just a couple, there were angles involved, involved in that. But that's that card and that's that TV taping. And I would think the building, it wasn't a horrible horrible disaster but i would say that it was half full it was half full real quick pat are you aware of this ever happening and your thoughts on that card the combination show to build up to super class that we'll talk about in a minute that they were building for lawler and carrie yeah i you know i did i i mean i was aware there was some of that that went on but i did not know about that size of a car i mean how i mean how long did it take to have 18 ma I mean how can you have 18 matches and have a match with a beginning middle and end or you more can. than you know more than one it took three days pat i'll be honest with you i, I was the a ring announcer for all of those shows as randy remembers and, and that is those shows went long randy uh just to you what your point about it not being well attended didn't it wasn't that a big ticket price for the day though randy for for, for wrestling I want to say that was a twenty-five or a thirty-dollar ticket for back in that day. That would that would not surprise me. It was a no money was made because obviously Memphis was our town, but to get them to do that, it was a partnership with World Class and with Vern. Vern probably 
I think Jarrett and Vern got more money than World Class did because as we read this card, we, of course we had Kerry and we had Michael Hayes and we had the Samoan SWAT team, but we we had more Vern talent and more of the Memphis Memphis talent at all. So I had forgot that you did the ring announcer there. So it was three straight three straight nights. It was cer certainly Nashville on Saturday at the Municipal Auditorium, Sunday Louisville Gardens, Memphis on Monday. Were you there in all three markets? Yes, I did. Uh, yes, I was. And I still have the tuxedo that I wore then that I can still wear. I'm bragging, but yes, right. I was there, but yeah. uh, I'll, I'll tell you I, my fondest memory of this. You guys will get a kick out of this. I, I was at ringside and, and next to the, the timekeeper guy coffee was the timekeeper in Memphis and Lance and Dave were dressed. And then it was guy. And then I was at the end of the table. And I was wearing a headset. I did not have a microphone except to go in the ring and make the ring announcements. And we were in, in, in Memphis and Medusa got in the truck and she's getting on the IFB, which is the communication between the director and the truck and your commentators. And she, I think got in Dave and, and Lance's ear and they scoffed her off or, or made some kind of remark or whatever. And she, so she gets in my ear. And that was fun. She was a fun person. She was cracking jokes and saying things. And and you talk about somebody that really knew and knows wrestling. I, I have a great deal of respect for Medusa Michelli. But uh, uh, she was, I mean, that was a great card. And when you look at that card, Randy, look at all the people now that are either in halls of fame or are just oh, yeah. held in high, yeah, high regard. Absolutely. That was what that card was all about. No doubt about it, finishing up 88 and going to 89, and I'll kind of rush through this. In October, I got sick. I didn't know what the heck uh, was wrong with me except for partying too much, but I got sick and ended up going to the doctor in Hendersonville, and they said I had viral meningitis. Well, Jerry Jarrett panicked and thought that was catching and all that sort of thing. He said, you need to get out of town. So I ended up flying to Little Rock because my mother was out on a trip out of the country. And so I flew to my sister and brother-in-law. So I was out in October. And in October, also Sid Vicious debuted for the CWA. Then in 1989 was the year that I left in 1999. Uh, and I was away, and I left uh, shortly after Lance Russell, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Lance Russell decided to leave in early March, the first week of March of 1989. He left, and then as a regular time period, I was gone at this point. Lance certainly went before Ronnie Gossett, before I was out the door, co-hosts the show, and I think – and I don't want to jump ahead too much because I want Michael's perspective, but but let's get there. But certainly, Lance, Michael came along pretty soon after that, and Dave was still around as well. This was all a build for Super Clash 3 that grew horrible. It drew in Chicago at UIC Pavilion uh, only – 1,672 people. The estimated buys for the pay-per-view is not too bad. If this is right, 45,000. And the card was this. The Guerreros against Cactus Jack and the RPMs. Eric Embry over Jeff Jarrett in the second match. Jimmy Valiant against Wayne Bloom. King Parsons against Brickhouse Brown. Wendy and Top Guns over Bad Company and Medusa. It was Greg Gagne over Ron Garvin by Count of the Ring. Sergeant Slaughter over Colonel De Beers. The SWAT team over Michael Hayes and Steve Cox. Wahoo McDaniel over Manny Fernandez. Jerry Lawler over Kerry Von Erich to win the Unified Championship. And the final match on the pay-per-view, the Rock and Roll Express and Stud Stable. That's probably the worst pay-per-view that anybody – had ever done, and and I don't want to spend much time on this because the main topic that the kind of Memphis wrestling I want to get to, and it's almost eight thirty, so I don't want to spend five minutes on 
on this card. But Pat, Super Clash, what do you think? You know, I, what I think of this thing, I, I, and I, I've read and, and heard Jerry talk about trying to pull some folks together, and and I think originally he thought he could put the put the world class together with with AWA and and um, and uh, compete with Vince, but but you know you you can put names up there, but I think Memphis never had a chance at that because pe- people came to Memphis wrestling for the storylines, not not the famous wrestlers. Now they got famous, but it was because of a storyline. Hundred percent agree with you. Pet, put this story to death uh, right now, uh, Michael. And I want you to talk about Super Class real quick. And then after that, talk about the effect. And we opened the show with great stuff about Lance Russell. All of a sudden, he went away. I don't know if you know the details or if I need to tell the details of what happened but it's basically a money situation where he was offered more money i can say that real quick that's basically turner broadcasting was putting out the money uh, and got lance russell and lance felt that he needed to go and he did go and it all happened so talk clash then talk super clash then talk lance leaving i think the name of the pay-per-views was proper i think it was the super clash of styles and the style of Memphis and the style of Dallas and the style of Minneapolis were three different things. And I think when you try to put that on a national stage or an international stage for the pay-per-view, it didn't fly. There wasn't enough showbiz to it at that point in time in professional wrestling, in my opinion. There was some good wrestling talent, but they all had their different styles. Minnesota was more of an amateur lockup wrestling style. It was it was slow. It, it didn't have the didn't have the pump that that a lot of styles were at that time. Uh, the Dallas style, let's face it, the Dallas style was the Von Erics. Anything yes. over and above the Von Erics, yeah, you can talk about Chris Adams and Gino Hernandez and some of the old guys that were or guys prior to Clash. But at this point in time, all that was left was a unfortunately very ill-fated Von Erich family. And that didn't fly. And I don't think the Memphis people, I know, you know, I think the Memphis crowd, the Memphis fans back in that day, and even looking back on it, I think the Memphis fans loved the fact that when Jerry would bring in a Ken Patera or would bring in a Paul Orndorff or would bring in a, a, a superstar out of another territory and Lawler would find a way to win, not always one, two, three, but he'd find a way to win. I think they got used to it and they love that. But then all of a sudden you see all of these people at the same arena at the same time and the same, and, and the crossover of the styles, it didn't work. And obviously the wrestling fans took to that and knew it didn't work. Talk about Lance leaving and your first time coming in after Lance left and Ronnie Gossett was a failed experience as a host is which Jerry Jarrett wanted to go that direction and we did and he knew real quick that wouldn't go from work and michael st john came came in i ended up leaving so i don't have much memories of this situation so we talked lance leaving and michael arrived well i got called to jerry's house one day and i had no idea that lance had left or was leaving and he told me what was going on and it was you know and and let's be honest in this business in a broadcast business whether you're michael st john or lance russell or scott shannon or whoever you want to make the biggest splash you can on the biggest stage Absolutely. And at that time atlanta was a big stage right. and i think lance knew he was quote unquote over and 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 what he was in memphis he wanted to see how it would be on Georgia championship or our own world class or, or whatever world championship, world championship wrestling. wrestling at that point. And I think that's what motivated. I, the money was good, no doubt about it, but I think Lance in his heart wanted to say, Hey, I got one more shot at the big one. I'm going to try it. God love him. And, and unfortunately it did not work out for Lance at the time, but fortunately he did come back to our Memphis uh, situation and God love him for that. But, uh, personally, I, I got the call and I, and, and Jerry, I just gotten back from Phoenix. I had just gotten back to Tennessee. I was working on a project to buy some radio stations with 
three other uh, investors and um, I had some time and uh, Jerry told me what he wanted. He said, uh, you know, you can't replace Lance. You can be in there. You can just call it the way you do. And then we'll bring in people to be your co-host and so forth and so on. And yeah, I, I mean, that, it was a tough time for me. I also had two kidney stone surgeries from the time that I actually got the opportunity in 88 until the time that I left for, uh, for Los Angeles in 92. But, uh, you know, that was a tough situation for everybody. And I think in reality, hindsight 2020, Jerry Jarrett knew that sooner or later he would not be able to fight Vince McMahon on the national stage with not as much the wrestling, but the marketing and the and the, the selling of the, the gimmicks and the kids, more so the kids being raised up into that quote unquote new wrestling environment. I think I think that sort of led to everything, to be honest with you. The Ronnie Gossett experience, you know, Ronnie was a heat-seeking missile. Wherever yes. Ronnie, all Ronnie would have to do was be walk out, and he would be an instant heel. I've I've been I, I went to lunch with Ronnie in Chattanooga in in, in nineteen or in, in twenty uh, twenty five, and I went up there and we were talking about a little thing that he was doing, and and uh, I went up there and took him to lunch, and he walked into Shoney's and he drew heat. So, I mean, he just walked oh. into the building and drew heat. He got heat with the boys. And that's why, oh, yeah. it's all, okay. because other people were doing heel commentaries, it just didn't work in Memphis. It absolutely, and I wanted to clarify that Jerry Jarrett was mad, mad, mad that Lance had left. As a matter of fact, we were, I think he, Lance told me, and this was in 1989, and and Lawler and Lawler called Jerry Jarrett and he said, I don't want him ever to be on my television again. And he's not getting paid his last check and his name would not be mentioned on this TV ever again. And then the very next week, Dave Brown, his good friend, mentioned him on the thing. And there was big time hatred, especially on the Lance Audrey Russell side over that situation. But in later years, they gave up. And I told this story before when I went to Lance after he left WCW, which by the way, he was bad and misbooked. He was hired, Lance Russell was hired, then wasn't allowed to be Lance Russell. Well, let me add to that real quick, Randy. You can't have one and one A in your commentary. You've got to have a and, and I, I have te teach this, uh, Adam Ward won our broadcaster of the year again. Adam Ward is the number one guy. Whoever he's got as his color guy is his number two guy. You got to have a number one play-by-play, -play, and you got to have a number two that's color. You can't have a play-by-play -play and a play-by-play. -play. And that's sort of what happened with Gordon and, uh, and Lance in, in Atlanta. Right, and I, th I think it's just a, a a bad situation, a bad situation. Now, what we're going to do... And, on... they, and they weren't alike. No, you know, no, no, they not just at all. weren't alike. I like, I mean, Two I grew styles. up on board, yeah. Two different styles. What we're going to do, we're going to start the subject, and I think we have a caption, the decline of Memphis wrestling, and this is what we'll do right now, because I want Michael, I want you, I want Pat... And I will go through quickly my list. Next week, I want you guys to have your own thoughts. Today, I'm going to read my list, explain my list, and then want you guys to comment. And certainly, I think Michael has notes printed out, so he knows what I'm going to say. He's cheating a little bit. Pat never looks at my notes, I don't think. I've got, I've got your notes pulled up right now. All right. Hey, can't, do a show. can't do a show on TV without a format, buddy. Absolutely. So this is in no particular order, but I think it's fair to say the first thing on the list that led to the decline of Memphis wrestling was no doubt Jimmy Hart leaving for the WWF. Lance Russell, even though 1985 was when Hart left, a big cog in the the wheel that was gone later to be followed by Randy Savage and earlier, but Jimmy Hart leads for the WWF. But the shot was fired, guys, before that. This is a Lance Russell story, and I remember this like it was yesterday, and it happened on my birthday, December the 10th in 19, 
83. Because on WTGF TBS Channel 17, the super station, everybody was watching it. So Jerry Lawler had booked for a double main event. Now, the people, I'm backtracking, but to make sure everybody understands this, Jerry Lawler had a somebody in real life that hated him. Now, in Lexington, Kentucky, it meant something because they got Randy Savage, Angelo Poffo, Lenny Poffo's ICW. So they meant something in Lexington, maybe in Louisville. Didn't mean anything in Memphis at all. So the main event of a card, and 83 was the best profit year and the best grossing year in Memphis wrestling history for money. But the last three months, it became a, not a dying, but it declined greatly with crowds of 3,000 people. But they went with the double main event, and I guarantee you the money that night was now in the long term, it's no doubt the money was Randy Savage and Jerry Lawler. But the money that night, even though that helped, people watching Memphis TV didn't know Randy Savage, never saw him on Memphis TV before, didn't ever see him. So that didn't do it. Road Warriors against the Fabulous Ones was a money match. Road Warriors hot off that TV. It went from 3,000 people to 9,000 people. Lance Russell came up to me after the show was over and everybody excited and said, said, Randy, said, everybody's jumping up and down, thrilled to death, absolutely thrilled to death that we had this great crowd. And it's, it's great and paid the deals. But what it tells me, this business has changed and we'll never get back to it. The days of the territories are over. This is step one. The people came to see the big national stars. And that's the way it is. And I want to read this whole list, but certainly Lance telling me that. So number one is heart leaving for the WWF and the effect on cable TV. Pat, will go with uh, you in a short soundbite he, here. Do you agree with those two factors in the decline of Memphis wrestling? Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't grab as my first one heart leaving for the WWF, although, you know, it's symbolic as much as anything. But, yeah, c cable TV, and I've told this story before, you know, I, I was exposed to cable TV early, very early. Yes. And, and you know, it it's just, it was a whole new thing. I mean, you, you don't, you, instead of having your local soap opera now, if you want to call Memphis wrestling that, you got 15 other soap operas to watch. Now, if you look at the heart situation, first of all, yes, in 86, they did some good stuff, 87, 88, 89, and then late, later on. But as a weekly event, especially in Memphis, it crashed with heart leaving because they've gone two years for that thing. So real quick, and I want to get out of here on time and we'll continue this talk. I just want to get the list in. But your your quick thoughts on heart leaving and the effects on cable TV. Real quick, Michael. I think the heart thing was the first shot without a doubt. Uh, I think I, I do agree with, with Randy on that. That was the first shot. Cable TV was coming. Uh, I mean, satellite TV, you, you, we always say cable TV. People had monstrosity 12 and 10 foot dishes in their backyard watching wrestling from all over the world, me being one of them. And so that was playing into that demise as well. And as we'll just go ahead and, and say several, what cable TV did, it led to the decline and death of the territories as Lance Russell predicted that Monday night on December the 10th, 1983, the decline and death of the territory that led to Vince going national, getting all the talent, including Randy Savage and so many, every top guy in every territory, including the junkyard dog, just so many people left. Also, what happened to combat that, Jerry Jarrett decided, I under 100% understand it, World-class wrestling because Jerry figured because of the television syndication rights, he really felt 
and did for quite a while as he popped that territory. World class became his top priority. It really did. Lawler certainly didn't have a piece of that action, so he wasn't real happy about, about it. World class became the priority, not Memphis. That ended up falling apart with the Von Erichs being goose and certainly ended up filing charges against Jared saying he was stealing money and all that. He was running it like a business. I'll totally support Jerry and that he was, he wasn't going to have guys. He wouldn't let Jeff do this. He wouldn't let me do this. Michael do this. You couldn't walk in the box office and say, give me a thousand dollars. Well, the Von Erichs could do that in Dallas and he put a stop to that. So you, you completely understood that. I think another big blow was Lance leaving for WCW in March of 89. And then in 93, even though it led to new guys like PG-13, Brian Crisper, and other things, Monday Night Memories, and, and Lance coming back and different things, the 93, Jeff Jarrett, Jerry Jarrett, and Jerry Lawler at the same time. And Jerry went there full-time. Jeff went there full-time. Lawler just part of the time, but it affected this territory. So that's my list. I'm sticking uh, to it. And I want you guys to have a list and we'll more, get more details about that. So did I just listen to this, Michael, we'll go with you first. Is there anything obvious that I missed? You know, I'd have to go back and read some notes from back when I was doing that. I think you hit all the nails on the head though, Randy. I mean, I can't argue with any of these. I think that, you know, I may say, well, this one is a little bit better and bigger in priority than the, the other one. But you mentioned that, uh, the, the third, the thing that you mentioned about world-class becoming a priority, you know, Jerry, I think when he bought world-class, uh, I think he and Fritz were friendly enough and knew each other enough to trust each other. But I don't think Fritz, as the dad, was willing to admit, and certainly not to somebody that's about to buy his territory, that all but one, well, all of them at that time oh, yeah. were druggies. They were on drugs. Every one of them. Every one of them. And now, uh, as a father, which I'm not, and both of you guys are, it's a situation. And I would think, is it kind of human nature? Not now. You would think, as a father, you need to be responsible. If your kid's in trouble, you don't embellish it. You deal with it, and you deal with it hard and heavy, and try to get them help. But is it human nature not to see the issues in your kids? I'll let Pat answer that question first. Um. Uh, uh, no. You know, I, I don't know how much I should talk about family's business, but uh, no, you have a you have an antenna for that thing, and we had to address that once in in high school. Uh, nothing nothing serious, but but something that could have gone the wrong way. I mean, I've we I've always had an antenna for that. Now, you know, to hear Jerry tell the story, Fritz told him he wouldn't get in business with his boys. That was um, an after the fact thing though, Pat, that, that happened after the deal was done. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, y'all were, y'all were there in a part of it, but you know, that, that, that Von Eric whole situation is just tragic and strange and everything else. My answer to that is a situation like that, Randy, the question you posed is a family matter. And you take it to heart. You love your children. I mean, I've, I, I have, I have five in my, my collective family, two of which don't talk to me and haven't since my mom passed in 2012, but I still love them. And if I talk, could talk to them today and the, the ice be broken, I would not ever say anything over the last 11 years. But when issues like this happen, it is a family issue and families number normally come together and it's a private matter that is addressed by family. Unfortunately for the Von Erichs, their family was playing out on syndicated national TV on Saturday nights on KTVT Channel 11 in Dallas. Yes. And I think that added to the to the problem. I think it did, too, for sure. And here's the thing to go more into kind of the financial 
details, Jerry, Jerry is certainly smart enough to realize that the money, the business is going toward TV rights and TV revenues and that sort of thing. And at the time, it was syndication. And world-class wrestling was syndicated all over. And their glory days as far as talent and stories were kind of gone, just like the glory days of the Memphis Territory was gone. But Fritz saw that Jerry Jarrett was a great businessman, and he saw they couldn't go on like they were going on. And it had to be be changes. And Jerry Jarrett kind of did a bailout financially because they were – Owed, uh, owed a lot of people, TV stations and arenas and venues. They owed money and even talent. And Jared called them all up. And so it was a money situation where Fritz didn't want to lose anymore. And Jerry Jarrett was thinking, well, Memphis, I think he really thought Memphis will never come back the way it was. It never will. And we can't syndicate that show, but we can syndicate the – sportatorium show and and it's in a bigger market in dallas and that sort of thing and the syndication and in the beginning jeff who made uh, who became minority partners with his dad they made huge jerry bought a, a yacht and a house in florida and all kinds of stuff so on both sides it was all about money do you agree with that I, I do, but I also think Jerry and Jerry was, and, and I will say this, and I said this a few weeks ago when I was talking about it, Jerry, Jared had a great view on the future. Jerry could, could, could see things that as they were developing on the front end of the wave before you got to the top of the wave. And he always had that. And I think he saw Dallas as not only a, a, an opportunity to bring that, that territory, bring that program back, but he saw it as a way to channel Memphis style into TV. Now, when they first went into Dallas, they pretty much stayed with the way Dallas was doing things. But by the time I got involved in 90 and 91, Jerry was starting to bring Memphis wrestling into Dallas and into the sportatorium and into those Texas towns. But unfortunately, the Von Erich thing, the Von Erichs in that territory and on that program were the were the golden egg. They were the, they were the yes. golden egg. Like and Jerry Lawler was in Memphis. Exactly. And that never changed. And I think ultimately that was a failure. There was one little thing that did happen. And I think it took, it took Jerry by surprise, Jerry law or Jerry Jarrett by surprise. Remember you just mentioned renegade, uh, renegade rampage. And he had a great deal with us tobacco company. He really did. We yes. had a Mac that had the renegade logo on it. Yes. The second week it was on KTVT in Dallas. They they told him he couldn't put that mat on TV anymore because there was an and it's still in effect. There is a ban against cigarette advertising, cigarette advertising right. on television and radio. Right. It's been in effect since the 70s. Right. So early 70s. So he lost that revenue that he thought he could get additional revenue for being on an international syndication or an international super station as KTVT channel 11 was in Dallas. And he lost that because of a rule that perhaps may have, may have not been, a, he may not have been aware of when he bought, bought WCCW. I think he might've just been thinking like in Memphis, you could get away with sneaking stuff in and, and you couldn't, do you think this subject, because I'm sure you two guys might have, list of your own and we can expand it. I, I spent 20 minutes on a subject that I meant to spend the whole show on, but it's been a great show, a fun show. So I don't regret doing it all. So just your thoughts, Michael, can we get more out of this or do we need to oh, move on to a different subject? There are a lot more stories to be told. I mean, and you know, some of them, Randy, and I know some of them, and I know probably some of our, our viewers and listeners can chime in as well. I think this is a very, very interesting part of the legacy of Memphis wrestling. I really, really do. Do you agree, Pat? I do. I do. And I, well, I was going through your list. I was thinking about kind of some thoughts I had about that. One of the most controversial situations as we come to the end of talking Memphis wrestling is uh, certainly Michael St. John, Pat Trammell, missing Chris Ellis. In the studio, in the control center, Adam Dunn is in the house. Really like this show today, but there's one 
thing, the thing, the number one thing that ended up finally leading way for Power Pro Wrestling and the USWA going back. Let's do this, Michael, and let's shoot with it next week. We won't shoot with it now. We will tease it now. We'll try to make money for next week. We'll try to tease it and promote it for next week. But let me tell you the real story, people, about the whole deal. The beginning of the end was in a time period where I got burned out doing silly stuff and needed a rest. When I was gone, Jerry Lawler still going to the WWF, and he – he, I told him I'd booked for three years in a row or four years, and I said, hey, I need some time off. Well, what happened was he didn't want to deal with it. He brought Larry Burton in as the general manager, and the initial idea was to find a, a – first of all, buy Jerry Jarrett out, get rid of him. Second of all, find an investor, a mark, if you will, and I don't like that – money but this was like a double type of market uh thing the mark was really thinking lawler and larry burton was the mark and and burton was thinking this guy was a mark and it all went to hell i was gone dave brown was gone lance russell came back which i couldn't believe because i thought that larry burton was in any business in my life and I thought he had no respect can we talk about that your experiences if some of them's good you can uh you can I can tell you some I, downtown Bruno freaking knocked the shit out of him one night one day you might have been at TV that day he really did little old downtown good looking Bruno from Walls, Mississippi, 42 Kings Boulevard, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, knocked the shit out of Larry Burton. Hated the guy. So how about, can we get roughly two hours out of that next week, Pat? I think so. And then Absolutely. keeping up with current, it'll be the go-home show. Won't it be for WrestleMania weekend? So we can certainly do that as well. Final comments on today's show, Talking Memphis Wrestling, Pat Trammell. Well, it's we've talked about a lot today, and I, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I, I really uh, happy birthday, Lance. And uh, I'll tell you that 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 uh, that Rusty did was just really, really, really moving, and I uh, I enjoyed that a lot, and I you know enjoyed this conversation and everything in the middle. It's you know we you you don't want to ramble too much uh which i don't think we have i think we've had some really good conversation led by by you and michael and and i've enjoyed it you know here's the thing about laying out a wrestling show laying out michael's if he did a oh, laying out the creative for his morning show he didn't walk in say you host the morning show in los angeles you just don't walk in there and start talking. Now, you can react to a phone call. You can react to breaking news. You can do your ad lib. But how many times do we do a show and don't use hardly any of it because something's happening? Something's happening. And that's what I want this show to do. I wasn't planning to talk about college basketball or certainly world baseball and can give you can you give me an update on that score bottom of the seven nobody out japan leads the usa three to one and it has been a defensive struggle sounds like it oh, for sure so you know I, th I think one thing we do we have to to be organized and have material honestly if they're just one of, if it's me and Michael, if it's me and Pat, me and Chris, or if all three of you have something to do at the same same time with no notice at all, and and obviously Adam can can come in and and help me out, we can get two hours out of it because of the fact, or oh, with just say with just me because of the fact I'm organized and I'm prepared and I have a direction. Would it be as good as? 
the three of us together? No, it wouldn't be. But sometimes you have to to deal with what you have to deal with, and it's the excitement of live broadcasting, whether it's radio. And we congratulate Michael St. John as we put up the fun radio stations information up there right now. As we'll give that a plug ski on the show ski tonight ski fun radio folks. This. If you want to listen to the Alabama version, just go Fun Radio Alabama. If you want to listen to the Tennessee version, Fun Radio Tennessee. Is there a simpler way for us to tell people how to find you? FunRadioAL.com, FunRadioTN.com, and FunRadio927.com. And, of course, the one you love is WRABRadio.com, which is Classic Country. And by the way, uh, uh, you know, I was missing a couple of weeks ago. I had to be out because of the, an issue uh, that w- developed with the radio station. We have now been, become the first North Alabama radio station outside of the Huntsville market itself, outside of a Huntsville or Birmingham station to go high definition. And so we're uh, on 927 FM, on 927 HD, and now Fun 927 HD2, which is Scott Shannon's true oldies channel. Oh, right. Right. Big We've news. We've got that going. So it's big news. And it's driving my wife crazy because she's having to redo all the, the media stuff for the uh, marketing and the sales thing. So God love her. She's she's worked her tail off. But, um, yeah, we, we, we're excited about all of that. And, Randy, I want to thank you for the platform that you have given me. You and I are friends from a long time ago and have become much closer friends. And, I totally respect any and everything you have ever done, not only in the wrestling business, but what you've done with your life over the past three years. And uh, God love you, man. Keep doing what you're doing. And to my friend, Pat, you know, Pat, I, I, I didn't get to know you until we started this show, but I feel like you and I are brothers of the same, uh, of the same cloth being that a lot of our, our, our past has been parallel to each other. And I want to thank you every time that you're on the show, Randy can tell you when you're not on the show, I'm like, Where's Pat? So uh, you for what you had, we really appreciate. But thank you, Randy, so much for being uh, so kind to me. You have really made a difference in my life. Well, man, this show is great, and it takes the village, and the village we have is great. So is that your final words, guys? Any quick comments? Uh, to be continued. Uh, to be continued. <laughs> we will talk more about the decline of the Memphis Wrestling Territory, the Tennessee Territory. We'll do that next week, and we will tell stories that you've never heard. We'll give the dirt. We'll give you the badness. I will tell you that I ended up my ass in court as a expert witness against Larry Burton and against Jerry Lawler because Mark Selker, the new owner, had – had suiting, I got subpoenaed, Jerry Jarrett got subpoenaed, and that story has never been told. So how's that a tease for next week's Talk in Memphis Wrestling? For Pat Trammell, Michael St. John, we're going to let them go, and I'm going to do my plugs to get us out of there. Thank you, guys. I love you, man. Thank love you for you. our listeners. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. As we do every week, we do what's coming up and what's coming up tomorrow morning at nine o'clock at 953 the ticket.com. It is the Ticket Radio Network on the front row with Bud Row. It's the power hour. I might have a caption up there, Adam, and I might not. The power hour on the front row with Bud Row. Nine o'clock Central Standard Time, nine o'clock Central Standard Time on the Ticket Radio Network. 953 the ticket.com is the way you can get it globally and internationally and the state side. So be sure to check that out. And we want to hear from you. My buddy Rod called last week, got on the air. Would love to have some of you guys call in. We do the wrestling hour at nine o'clock central standard time, 870-930-3776. Then Monday night, what is it? It's expect the unexpected. What a show we watch. And I understand from Adam Dunn, who can say something here. Adam Dunn, did you not say last night when you were on the show last night that this upcoming show that we'll play next Monday 
is one of your favorite Power Pro shows of all time. Did you not tell me that, or am I seeing now and dreaming? <laughs> no, I I told you that it is one of my favorite shows because of the triple threat match between Bulldog Rain, Steve uh, Bradley, and uh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's one of my favorite shows. It goes all out in the parking lot and everything. So it's Bulldog Reigns, Steve Bradley, and who else? Uh, Vic Grimes. All right, Vic Grimes. I think something with the duo, with the mascot, all kinds of foolishness has happened. So I'm sure you're looking forward to that show next Monday. And hopefully we made it through this show without technical problems. I guess it was a fluke last night, right? I hope so. It certainly seems that way. The goal of this show is certainly to be a show that we teach the history of Memphis wrestling in a unique, unique situation. We have had Pat Trammell, who grew up as a fan of professional wrestling, Michael St. John, a great voice of Memphis wrestling and a great on air personality and he's pretty damn opinionated and he is pretty successful real successful hall of fame worthy successful in radio and we throw that at you pat's our money guy been in banking all his life and he always is great at looking at the money aspect of the wrestling so we try to do different things we'll also remind you that tomorrow night at seven o'clock central standard time join my buddy Greg Wayne, Greg Peel, and he will debut. He's done a couple of test runs, but he will debut Wayne's World. That's tomorrow night on Facebook. So all you have to do is go on Facebook. If you are on Facebook, and I'm, it might be on YouTube, not sure on that, but I know, like hell, that is on Facebook without a doubt in the world. So go ahead. And you can probably find him commenting on something on my page or just Greg Wayne Munford, Tennessee, Greg Wayne Munford, Tennessee. He has a great, great setup. It looks like a million dollars. He's working work today. On, I hadn't seen him. Can't wait to see him some, some new graphics and he'll debut that. And so that is going live and doing the debut show only one time to make a, First impression, so let's support Greg Wayne tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Glad everybody liked this show. Thanks to Pat Trammell, Michael St. John, and my producer, Adam Dunn. And we are out of here. Watch some baseball. Watch some basketball this weekend. Life is good. Be healthy. Love everybody. Thanks for, for supporting Talk and Memphis Wrestling. And good night to you. Talking Memphis Wrestling with Randy Hill and special guests.